Welcome back to everyone in the room and welcome to those of you who are joining us on the YouTube live stream. We're just giving everybody another half minute to arrive in the room and then Becky will introduce our keynote speaker, Carl Thomas. And we're also very happy to be joined by a BSL interpreter, Nikki, and a live captioner, Karen. So thank you to the two of you for being with us as well to make sure that this can be as accessible as possible to everybody who's tuned in. Hello everyone. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, my name is Becky and I'm really pleased uh, to introduce you to Carl Thomas, who's going to be giving tonight's keynote. So Carl is a serial entrepreneur. He's launched numerous technology businesses over the years, including his current award-winning fintech startup, which is called Audio Wings. Uh, he supports startup entrepreneurs, both as an advisor and a mentor, and he's helped the London South Bank University to develop their entrepreneurship programme. So great to have you here, Carl. Uh, we can't wait to hear more about uh, what you're going to talk to us about. So over to you. Becky, thanks a lot for the intro and good evening. Welcome all. My name's Carl, as Becky mentioned, and for some visual context, I'm a black man in my late 30s. Um, I'm a very dejected and despondent Man United fan right now, but I'm sat in my living room, in my living room slash office, shall I say, in front of a bookshelf of a lot of books that I'm yet to read, c'est la vie. But more importantly, welcome. Thanks for spending your evening here with us today. This is about the perseverance to pivot, to pivot, sorry. And just to give you a bit of context about myself. So as Becky mentioned, I've run a number of different businesses. My first business that I started was as a teenager, providing a range of different internet services to a number of different businesses around the UK. This was right before the dial-up um, or the dot-com bubble and burst. And I then kind of parlayed that to work for a number of different corporates, most notably O2 Telefonica. As Becky also mentioned, I set up my own technology company, Audio Wings. Um, but more importantly, I think that experience has given me a lot of insight to really help students like yourself, different graduates, and also a number of different entrepreneurs help them understand how to take an idea from just that to something which is a bit more tangible, a bit more um, demonstrable, and also something which can be launched and help people actually have um, another revenue stream. Now, from my perspective, I've never been someone who was formally educated in business. I fell into business as a teenager and I've made a shed load of mistakes in my businesses that I've run and started. But the one thing that I've realized is that business doesn't need to be complicated. There is a very simple framework that can be followed to help you understand how to take an idea forward. And key to that is having perseverance and also having an experimental mindset so that you can iterate, get feedback, validate your concept further, and then potentially launch to uh, a thriving audience. So basically what I'm trying to say is that if I can do it, then anyone can do it. And honestly, I do dine out on that picture of myself and Richard Branson because it really just demonstrates that a kid with very little business experience can actually get to having a seat with someone like Sir Richard Branson. So we're talking all about the perseverance to pivot here. Why do you need perseverance as an entrepreneur? And more importantly, why should you have to pivot as an entrepreneur? You've got a great idea in your head, something that you feel is going to add so much value. Why do you want to stray away from that? Well, firstly, as Einstein stated here, if you do the same thing over and over again, you're going to get the same results. It's insane to think that you're going to get a different outcome if you just keep on doing the same thing over and over again. So the value of pivoting is that you really want to strive to make sure that you're getting great positive feedback to help you in your entrepreneurial journey, A, and B, also to help your product get to market. So pivoting is essential to help you get an idea to launch. 
Now, I'm sure you've seen this um, framework before. And if not, I'm going to give you a bit of a cheat code here, because ultimately about a good five, six years ago, Michelle and Becky can kind of verify this further. A group of universities in Europe came together to try to deconstruct what it means to be entrepreneurial. They analyzed a number of different entrepreneurs to understand what kind of skills and attributes the most successful entrepreneurs have. And what you see here is the output from that work. Now, the one, the three that I really want to take note of are uh, the fact that they stated that entrepreneurs are able to spot opportunities, take initiative, and also have motivation and perseverance to proceed in their entrepreneurial journeys. Now, all this means is that entrepreneurs are really experimental. They're able to see things that they can help validate very quickly and take initiative in validating that opportunity, and then also have the motivation and perseverance to do that. So guess what I'm trying to say in a very kind of fluffy way is that it is absolutely imperative to have both perseverance and also to be able to see see opportunities, see examples where you can actually take initiative and move forward with momentum to kind of validate your ideas. Now, what that means from a framework perspective is that it's probably best to have a very flexible model that gives you the agility to understand how you can kind of demonstrate that you can get feedback and then use that feedback in your product, in your business to then move forward, as opposed to having a really rigid, static, documented plan of what you're going to do to move forward. And to demonstrate this further, I want to just show you a couple of case studies of businesses that you may have heard of who have done things well and businesses who haven't done things as well. So before I do that, again, I'm sure you've all seen this model, the business model canvas. If you've not, then again, just a very quick glimpse into it. This is a model which enables you to really quickly chart your assumptions around what your idea is and who it provides value to. Specifically, it gives you a very quick, um, the very quick ability to understand the problem you're solving and for who and what the value is that you're going to provide them with. All right. Now, the way I personally like to use this model canvas is by having a big a1 print out of it up on my wall so I can then start to use post-its to chart my assumptions around who I'm serving, the value I'm providing, the features and benefits of that value, and then also as well the revenue model, the key partners, etc. So this is a really crucial framework to use to then have a very agile methodology to experiment all the different aspects of the business to then move forward with that feedback, iterate, and then also start to hopefully get closer to launching your idea to people who are actually infused by your idea. And as I said, I'm sure Michelle, Ava, Becky have told you a lot more about the business model canvas specifically. But going back to the case studies, again, I'm sure you've heard of Motorola, and I'm probably going to demonstrate my age now by talking about this case study somewhat. But back in the 1990s, to give you a bit of context, in 1990, the, there was no Vodafone, there was no e-network, there was no O2 Telefonica, there was no global telephony platforms that existed. People didn't run around with phones in their pocket, they had phones in briefcases or in their cars. Right. So the mobile telephony network, um, mobile telephony landscape was very different to what it's like now. Motorota, Motorota, Motorola had a grand concept to blanket the globe in uh, telephony networks so that wherever you were, you can make a phone call to anywhere else on the planet. And to do this, they had some technology that they spun out and raised 5.2 billion US dollars for. That spin out was called Iridium. And what Iridium was designed to do was basically launch satellites into the lower orbit of the planet to enable a backbone network for telephone communications to exist, irrespective of where you were on the planet. So whether you were in the Antarctic, whether you were in Brazil, whether you're in Paris, you could pick up a call, pick up a phone and call anyone anywhere. And they did everything from launching these satellites to providing that backbone network to even developing the phones that you could use. So irrespective of who you were, where you were, make a call and connect and speak to anyone on the planet. And they went over to Russia, they bought 50 rockets, they built 72 satellites to launch this thing. And what they did, they wrote a very documented plan to demonstrate exactly what they were going to do in their business. And in that plan, they stated by 2002, so just 12 years later, they would have 42 million paying customers. 
And unfortunately, I can't see you now, but I'm sure if I was to ask you to raise your hands if you heard of Iridium, very few hands, if any, would go up. Because ultimately, as you can see, they went bust in 1998 after raising 5.2 billion. So the question is, what happened to them? Well, quickly, their development took 11 years, you know, and by the time they actually developed their technology, the likes of BT Cellnet, which then became O2, existed, the likes of Orange, which became EE, existed, the likes of Vodafone existed, the likes of Three existed, and they existed not just in metropolitan areas, so main cities across the world, but they pretty much were able to provide a very disparate but blanket coverage of cellular network across the planet. So long and short, there was no real need for Iridium, all right? There are very few places left that couldn't get access to a cellular network, A. B. The calls were ridiculously expensive. C, the handsets looked horrific, as you can see, and they cost a lot of money. And at their peak, they were only able to attract 30,000 customers. And that's a massive shortfall compared to the 42 million that they're trying to appeal to. So when you distill all of that down into the, the reason why they failed as a business, it was because ultimately they spent 11 years heads down in the offices without any, net, without any kind of process to acquire feedback from the market or their potential customers. All they were doing was building technology and sticking rigidly to their business plan to launch. And by the time they did launch, their business plan was hideously outdated. Um, their customers have moved on to different types of solutions. And the problem that they are trying to validate and trying to overcome no longer existed. All right. So hopefully that is an example for you of how not to run a business. Now, another example of a company that has pivoted is probably one that you're not aware of, Nintendo. So back in 1889, Nintendo was started as a manufacturer of playing cards. Funnily enough, they've got a massive relationship with the Yakuza, um, you know, the, the biggest kind of mafiosa-esque gang in Japan. And by the end of the Second World War, they were the largest playing card manufacturer in Japan. Now, they were um, taken over by the son of the founder, whose name I'm going to hideously mispronounce, and I apologize. Um, so it's Hiroshi Yakahuchi. But he recognized that they were being caught up by the rest of the market in terms of how they're manufacturing playing cards. And they needed to basically have other ways to service their customers and also obtain revenue. So they started to look at other opportunities. And the thing is, what he did... Hiroshi Yakahuchi, he realized that Nintendo had a really strong brand. People knew who Nintendo were. They had a really strong relationship with the customers, A. And B, they had great manufacturing resources to create really compelling products. So with that, post-World War II, they started to look at a number of different services they could provide to appeal to their customers. So again, a lot of their customers happened to be Yakuza gangsters. So they started seeing that a lot of Yakuza gangsters were basically taking a number of different transport services to and from their shops. So they started providing a taxi service. And that taxi service started out by simply being a shuttle service between Yakuza headquarters and their shops, but then started to branch out, obviously not only catering to core Yakuza members, but also to the general Japanese public as well. That didn't really work out. So they then started to look at how they could provide um, people who were affected by um, Yakuza um, events, shall we say, and you know try and provide them with a service that would help them have a more um, easier and compelling family life. And and they started providing baby strollers because they had that manufacturing expertise. That didn't really work out. They then also realized that a lot of their um, customers were starting to be really appealed by fast food services. So they started looking at how they could provide fast food services in conjunction with big brands and also at the time celebrities. So they started stuff like ramen and instant, instant rice um, you know, services. And that didn't work out. But then around 1964, they realized that there was now a, a market for people who were looking to start to play games and a, a market for people that were starting to incorporate electronics into toys. And they had a lot of expertise in creating electronics. And they also had a market, a brand, which could be really compelling to people that wanted to start to play games and have toys. So they created the first smartwatch. And it was basically a very simple watch where you could play a version of Pong on it. And that was wildly successful. So that then gave 
gave them the impetus to start to explore that further. They got momentum, they had perseverance, they had the, the resources to create um, a more of a gaming brand. And in 1983, they launched the, the NES, the Nintendo Entertainment System. And that was basically one of the first consoles that came to market outside of Atari and some of the things that were happening in the US. And that came to market with Donkey Kong, which gave us Mario, which gave us other massive characters. And as we all know, the Nintendo story really took off after 1983 and the launch of the NES. Because what they're able to do is to understand their brand and who their brand appealed to, understand the problems that their audience were having with regards to their different services. And through a number of different pivots or even just iterations, they were able to understand how they could really provide value and help overcome problems that the customers were facing aligned with their manufacturing capabilities and provide great services and provide great products and experiences to their core audience. So I think Nintendo is a great example of a brand that has, through its history, got developed a culture of constant iteration, constant perseverance, and a constant experimental mindset to pivot to basically have something which is now a, a standout success story. So hopefully you will take that on board. So just to kind of go back to, you know, what we, how we define a, a business and what we are doing today. To clarify, all you guys here, I'm sure you have incredible ideas. I'd love to hear them more, but ultimately what you are not doing is creating a business. What you are absolutely doing is creating a startup which can basically give you the ability to experiment, find something that works, find customers that are going to resonate with the value you provide, and then understand and hopefully help you, um, understand how you can actually repeat what you have. And Steve Blank here, he's a great academic for um, Stanford University. He defined a startup in a way whereby it's a temporary entity, which is basically striving to find a repeatable and scalable business model. It's a temporary entity just trying to find a repeatable and scalable business model. And the way you do that is by constant experimentation, by having an agile mindset, by not being fixed to a specific route or a specific um, problem you're trying to solve or a specific product, right? Your goal as entrepreneurs is to understand how best to solve the problem of the customers you are trying to serve. And the best way to do that is by having this experimental mindset to constantly learn, to constantly get feedback, to constantly Im involve that feedback in your prototype process to then constantly try and provide value, right? That is your sole goal here. So hopefully that, that resonates and that makes sense. So, the best way to obtain um, the perseverance to then constantly iterate and pivot is to get momentum, okay? And the only way I believe to get momentum is to get positive feedback from your customers. And the best way to get positive feedback from people is to show them something. Show them something that they can really get on board with. Show them something that they can hold and they can play with and they can touch, right? And the process of developing something that they can touch and hold and feel and play with and then give feedback is called prototyping. Now, in my business, um, as Becky mentioned, we are a fit tech business and we created headphones and we had a vision for headphones that will basically understand us, our body, to then provide relevant audio specifically for runners. Now, back when I started the business back in 2013, there was nothing really out there for that. So I had to constantly not only talk about what we wanted to do and the value we wanted to provide based on the feedback we've got from runners, but then also show them something that could work like or that could look like what we were hoping to develop for them. And that constant process of going out, speaking to runners, coming back to my office with my team, creating something, going back out, getting feedback on what we created, going back, iterating on what we created, going back out, et cetera, et cetera. That whole process helped us get to the stage where we're at. And it's the same process that we're hoping that you guys take to understand how to prototype, how to demonstrate what you prototype to customers, to then bring your customers back into the development process by the feedback they provide you, to then help you get closer to having a solution which can be really compelling. And when you launch, you launch to enthusiasts and not cricket. All right. So prototyping is so, so key here. And we're going to talk in a bit about the different types of prototypes you can have. Because ultimately, and this guy, Reid Hoffman, he founded LinkedIn, but he's got a quote which really resonates with me. If you are not embarrassed by the first version of your product, 
then you have launched too late. If you're not embarrassed by your first version, you have launched too late. And basically what that means is that what you absolutely cannot do is basically do what Motorola did and sit heads down in an office somewhere, disconnected from your audience, creating something for the sake of creating something because you might have got this incredible vision of your solution or you've got a really well-documented business plan and then launch and then actually launch to no one. What you need to be doing is constantly involving your customers in that development process, constantly getting positive feedback to give you momentum, to persevere, to constantly iterate based on the feedback you're getting to then launch to people who are already involved in that development development process who are already infused by the idea that you have and the problem you're solving and who value your product okay that is the whole point of prototyping now prototyping there are a number of different ways of how you can show your vision your product your service your solution to your potential customers a prototype can be really low fidelity low tribe it can literally be a drawing on the back of a napkin right through to something which can actually work like what you're hoping to develop so for example if you're looking to develop a community or if you're looking to develop um a an app then you can, in essence, have a wireframe, which is basically a set of drawings as to what that app or what the service or community will use will look like. And that will demonstrate the value you want to provide to people who may want to be a part of this community or use this app. Furthermore, you can even use a range of different tools where you need very little, little technical experience to use them to create a mock-up of what this app will look like to then enable someone to play with the app and get a feel for the value that it can provide them to overcome their solution. If you're looking to create a tangible product, then you may need a little um, technical experience to use similar tools, but you can still use Lego or cardboard to demonstrate what this product will look like and the value it can provide. And especially um, if you're looking at using electronics in your product, then you can use developed environments like the Raspberry Pi or the Arduino balls to very quickly create something that demonstrates the value that your product will hope to have to your audience. And this is an example of someone who's used Lego to create a really um, complex microfluidic um, platform to enable them to start to demonstrate the value they can provide to their customers um, using just something like Lego. So there's two different types of prototypes you can have. You can have something which looks like what you're trying to provide. And that could, again, just be drawings. It could just be a picture. But then there's also something that works like what you're trying to provide and doesn't need to look anything like what you hope to develop. And again, that could literally be an app that you create a mock-up of, and it literally works by clicking a button to go to the next screen. Or it can be something, as I mentioned, if you're looking to create an electronic product using Raspberry Pi, Arduino, et cetera. So there's a number of ways by which you can demonstrate what you're hoping to develop very quickly, very easily, and most importantly, very cost effectively. We're going to go into some of the tools that you can use to do just, just in a second, but I'm not sure if any of you have come across the concept of no code tools. I touched upon it earlier. What this, these are a set of tools that basically help you to very quickly and, uh, and effectively create something that you can get into the hands of your customers to then get feedback from them to start to iterate and add enough feedback into your development process so that you can then start to, you know, validate your assumptions around um, whether it's providing the right kind of value, the features, the benefits you're providing, et cetera, and then get you closer to having something that you can launch to enthusiasts. We're gonna have a quick look at a couple. And um, with your permission also, what I want to do is show you through a couple of tools that I've used personally and a lot of the students I've worked with and entrepreneurs I've worked with have used to create very quick, low fidelity prototypes that demonstrate their concept in a really impact manner. So firstly, card.co. So specifically, there are a number of platforms that help you create a fully fledged website, all right? As a startup, we've already come across, we've already talked about the fact that what you are not doing is basically trying to create something which is very fully fledged um, and ready to launch. What you are doing is striving to capture feedback by giving them an insight into what your idea could do and how it could actually overcome the problem that your customer has. So ultimately, what you probably do not need from the get-go is a fully-fledged website that talks about all the products you hope 
to have, the team behind the product, all the features and benefits, all the heritage of the, the kind of ecosystem that your product exists in, et cetera, et cetera. But what you simply need is just a one page landing page, which does two things really, really well. Firstly, it communicates the benefits of your potential products. And secondly, it captures interest, right? And the way it captures interest is by asking someone who sees that landing page just to register that interest by giving you an email address or even a phone number so that you can then start to get more feedback by surveying them, speaking to them, sending them a form, et cetera, to then get you momentum to then provide them with some value or provide them with a behind the scenes look at what you're developing. Because the powerful thing is, if you are able to show something to someone who already has the problem you're trying to solve and values your solution, they get bought into your whole development process. They feel a part of your journey. That's the ethos behind crowdfunding, for example. When people back products that don't really exist, but have a really viable um, process to exist, they become invested in that process. They want to see that process come to light. They want to see the product or service come to light. And this is a great way to catch interest. So I'm going to strive to stop sharing to then share the screen where I can tell you a bit more about Card and show you how it works. Hopefully this works well. We'll soon find out. Um, Okay, so hopefully you can see this. So Card is a very, very simple website builder or lending page builder, as I mentioned. I've got a lot of different ideas and products that I use, but here is an example that I created very quickly, very easily for a very simple um, place where one can have a look at different restaurants to eat out, okay? Now, the logo I created in Canva, again, it took me five minutes to create, and I apologize for the horrible purple hue, but ultimately Canva, uh, not Canva, Card is something where it's very simple to create a landing page. Every single block in Card is a container, and you can customize all of these blocks to look and feel exactly as you want your landing page to look and feel. So for example, I can change images very quickly. It's just a case of uploading an image, um, dragging and dropping it into the right place, or not dragging drag and dropping, just uploading it, um, changing the dimensions of the image, and I have a new image here that straight away loads onto the landing page with the right dimensions. I can then change the text really easily. I can make the text look slightly different. I can change the size of the text very quickly using the slider. I can change the font of the text very quickly using this menu button here. And all of it is done in real time. And basically what I see here is what I'm gonna get or what customers are gonna get when they look at the website. So I've done this prior to today. As I said, it took me about 10 minutes to kind of populate all of this. These are images that I just found. And also as well, key to a landing page, as I mentioned, is the ability to capture interest from potential customers. So here, I've just asked people for their name and for their email address so that they can then start to almost subscribe to my service. And the benefit for me is that if I was to share this link to my friends, family, network, colleagues that I go to uni with, et cetera, I can then see who actually values it by seeing who actually registered. And then what I can do, I can send them a survey or I can email them individually and say, well, look, what do you like about this? What don't you like about this? And get positive feedback. So when people talk about getting out of the office to get feedback or getting out of the building to get feedback, this is a very good way of doing just that. OK, because you can even put a, a very low key ad on Facebook for a couple of pounds for a day, run it to see whether people actually resonate with the service itself. OK, now I can then very quickly publish this. And what that then gives me the ability to do is basically have a website whereby this is ready. As you can see here, this is the website. You can go check it out for yourself. I'm gonna put this in the chat. So if anyone wants to have a look at it and critique me on it, feel free, but please be kind because I appreciate that. It's done very quickly and the purple is horrific. So 
that gives me the ability to very quickly create a web a landing page and as i said it can do that very quickly very easily um now card costs nine dollars a year so about seven pounds a year um for seven pounds a year you get the ability to create up to three different landing pages um, and publish them all to your heart's content. So for a very, very low cost, you get the ability to have something very quickly, which is up and running, all right? Now, what I didn't talk about is what you can actually use to collect emails. Simply, the emails can go into a spreadsheet and you can collect emails very easily like that way. But also you can use something like MailChimp or another dedicated email platform, which gives you the ability to collect emails and then also create a range of different emails that are sent out directly to your customers to get feedback on how they value your product, how they value your service. And there's a number of different platforms this uses, but I really do either advise you using MailChimp or just a simple spreadsheet. So that's how to create a landing page. To go back now to the presentation, once you have a landing page, you're going to want to provide or show something which actually works as you've stipulated. And especially if you're creating a digital, digital product, then you're probably going to want to create some form of app right, to show someone how, again, you can provide value to help them overcome the problem that they're faced with. Now, Whenever someone thinks about creating an app, they think about, oh, I'm going to need to be a techie, or I'm going to need to find a tech team, or I'm going to need to have technical experience, etc. The brilliant thing about a number of no-code tools is that you can create an app in minutes with no technical experience whatsoever. And one of the best ways that I've found is using a platform called Glide. Now, what Glide does, it enables you to create an app from a spreadsheet in minutes. If you've got any experience of using Excel, pardon me, then you can basically create an app. Now this app platform uses Google Sheets, which if you've not come across Google Sheets, is basically Google's version of Excel. And it's even simpler to use than Excel itself, but also has a lot of powerful features behind it. And as I said, once you are able to show someone your idea, and once you're able to then get them using and playing with your idea and getting them running through the app, and getting them looking at different screens, you can get really great positive feedback about your idea that will then help you iterate further to then start to maybe pivot or continue along the road that you're at. Because ultimately it's about being experimental, as I mentioned. So again, I'm gonna hopefully demonstrate how compelling Glide can be for you. And if you have any questions, please feel free to chuck them in the chat and we can kind of go through this in a bit more detail as well. So let me find glide for you there we go okay so once you have logged on or created a profile with glide you're then presented with this screen which if you haven't logged on before be completely blank um and as you can see i've got a number of different apps i'm always playing with so you want to create a new project. We'll create a mobile app and we'll call it Eat Out because that is the name of our landing page. And we're gonna hook it up to Google Sheets, okay? Now, before we do that, I want, I want to show you the actual spreadsheet that I've used to create this app. So this is a very simple spreadsheet of some data of restaurants that could be of interest to potential customers. What you can see here is on the first column, column A, uh, about eight different restaurants. They're real restaurants. I just found them on Google Maps with the type of cuisine they serve, their website address. Some of them I've actually fabricated, their actual physical address, their phone number, and the image of the website. And the image is just literally an uh, image that I've grabbed from that actual address. So you can do this in minutes. I then put together a bit of data around how much I think they're gonna be. Um, and also the other data is basically for the app to understand how to filter and sort some of these, um, some of these different options here. So if you're in any way, shape or form, OFA with Excel or with Google Sheets or any spreadsheet, you would be able to see that this is very simple to put together from a spreadsheet perspective, very simple to get this data and chuck it into a spreadsheet. Okay. Now, going back to Glide, we are then hooking up this Google Sheets with the Glide platform. We will look for our 
um, our spreadsheet. And now what Glide is doing is taking that spreadsheet, taking that data and turning it very quickly into an app. So it gives you a user interface, which looks like a smartphone. This is all the data. It's just chucked into a very simple app, but then it gives us a really simple interface to be able to customize what that app looks like. So for example, on the right-hand side, you can then customize the look and feel. So right now, it's basically taking all the data from the spreadsheet and putting it in a list. I can change that and say, look, I want it to, make, I want it to look nicer. So I'm gonna put it into tiles, right? So. You can then see the information that is taken. You can see that it's taken the actual image that I put in the spreadsheet, aligned with the name and the type of cuisine of that restaurant and put it in a very simple tile, which you can scroll down and you can see the rest of the data from the spreadsheet also. I can then click into it. And once I click into it, I can see all the details of that product or that restaurant, sorry. And I can see that here. Now, I've also got a couple of screens here. I can have a look at all the different reviews that I've also got in this app. I put together um, just some dummy data and I can also potentially make bookings. I can customize all of this. This is a dummy booking that I made when I first created this, um, this spreadsheet back in the day. So if we go back to the restaurants, we can then start to play around with what kind of data we actually put here. So on the left-hand side, this is where we start to look at all the different options that we have for how we start to customize this app. So for example, I may want to start to um, provide an ability for people to favorite the restaurant that you have. So I can have a favorite button very quickly. I can then also, maybe I want someone to, um, you know, look at having a form button that they can leave their own feedback, you know, so I can have a form which then opens up a specific Google form to provide survey feedback on the day on the actual um, restaurant itself. I can do all sorts of things. So for example, I can enable people to leave comments. I can enable people to rate um, what they think of the restaurant, two stars, one star, three star, and all of that is put back in the spreadsheet, but also as well, all of that is enabling a really intuitive and very simple to use interface for someone to understand what this app does and the value that this app has. And the good thing about this, I may do this for this specific restaurant, but then this is also available for all the other restaurants as well that I put into it. So it basically scales it right across all the data. And this is really important because the one takeaway I want you to get from all of this is that it's incredibly simple to prototype. And once you recognize that it's incredibly simple to prototype, hopefully that will help you, help you recognize that it's incredibly easy to showcase this to someone, to get momentum from the positive feedback that you get, to then have the perseverance to continue to prototype and to continue with the idea, and then to hopefully iterate based on the feedback you're gonna get, to then have a successful launch so that you are launching to people who are infused by not only the prototype, but also the process you've been on because you've invested them in that process guys there we're long past the days where you need to have technical experience to develop anything massive you know we're long past the days of you having to be like motorola and sitting in a darkened office somewhere working for 11 years and some technology you can do all of this so so quickly and look i know you've all just gone through a session whereby you've had some incredible ideas and you're starting to brainstorm about your ideas leverage these platforms to create something super simple super quickly that you can then showcase to people tomorrow to give you that momentum to give you that motivation to persevere should you want to with your teams and with the idea post this weekend to then start to validate and hopefully launch these ideas because entrepreneurship it's really about just having the perseverance to progress, to get feedback, to launch, as opposed to just writing great business plans or putting together really complex cash flow forecasts or all of that. People really do make entrepreneurship incredibly complicated. And I think with these kind of tools, gliding card especially, you can make these things so, so simple. Anyway, going away from the waffle, back to Glide. Um, once you have something that looks like what you want to showcase people, you can very quickly showcase it by just publishing it. All right. And again, Glide is free. So once you've got something, you can publish it. Um, and once it finishes loading, you will then have the ability to customize that URL, the website address. So let's call it Eat Out One. And then you can copy that and I'm going to chuck this in the link for the, I'm going to chuck the link in the chat. There we go. 
So straight away, you can have a play with that and tell me some feedback around the idea itself. And you can look at it and you can kind of try and break it. But ultimately, if I was very, if I was inclined to invest into this idea, then I can take your feedback and then start to use it to iterate and to pivot and to move forward with how we actually launch with something that is compelling to the people that we're looking to obviously provide value to. So that's Glide, that's Card, and hopefully it's given you a bit of insight into how to use those platforms. Now, I'm conscious actually that I've probably gone through this whole process really quickly, but hopefully it's given you a bit more insight into how you can really practically take some of these tools to then very quickly create something that hopefully gives you momentum to iterate constantly like a Nintendo, as opposed to actually heads down and just focus on developing something that you believe is going to be the perfect solution without having any feedback from potential customers. So let me share my screen and go back to the presentation. Okay, so I'm actually conscious that I've wrapped through that quite quickly, but are there any questions? I'm happy to use these next kind of 15, 20 minutes to go through any questions that anyone may have with regards to card, with regards to glide, or any of the kind of concepts of having an agile methodology that people may um, strive to be more experimental to obviously then start to launch things. Are there any questions at all that people may have? And feel free to um, jump in the chat, feel free to unmute yourself. I mean, from my perspective, what I didn't want is just to be a lecture of me just literally downloading on you because this ultimately is for your benefit. It's ultimately about what you take out of this session so that you can then start to implement for yourselves. So if you do have any questions, any concerns, any queries, if you want to berate me about Man United, now's the time, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> great. I mean, Carl, it's great to have a chance for questions. But first of all, can we just give you a clap before we do that? Because that was utterly stimulating and really fascinating. So thank you so much. Feel free to unmute and clap if you would like. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Carl. It's lovely to have time for questions. Um, because you've you've touched on something which ties in so well with where we're up to this weekend. Um, so for those of you joining us on YouTube, this event is part of a weekend working with creative industry students on how they can create new ideas, new innovative ideas in response to gaps or problems or things that aren't out there in the world. And the point we've reached in the weekend is where everybody has just started to come up with ideas that they're going to develop tomorrow. So you've given us some real insights about possible next steps for those ideas, which is fantastic. Um, so... Cool. Any questions for Carl, especially around things like what you do once you've got an idea, risks, what you do if things work, don't work, next steps, and especially with all of those things Carl's talked to us about in terms of how we might have an online presence for our ideas. Great, we've got a question from I love some of these comments and questions. And just to clarify, I know that I've glibbed over so much in such a short space of time. Um, and I apologize for that. I, I'm more than happy to go a lot deeper in some of the concepts. Um, first of all, I do love that comment, like that life exists pre-glide and post-glide. Seriously, it's transformational and glide is not on its own. There's so many tools out there which help you create not only apps and landing pages, but APIs and voice platforms for Alexa. They're whereby you you do not need to know how to code. You don't need to be techie. You know, it's empowering to believe you can create something that helps to, you know, if we're going to try to play it out, generate income for you guys to then start to validate your assumptions around your idea very quickly, very easily. So absolutely, I, I subscribe to that pre-glide, post-glide um, you know, analogy. I love that. But just, yeah, look at the first question then. So how do you act decisively and figure out your best idea to take forward? Love that, that's such an important question. So there's no right or wrong answer, but ultimately, as we stated in the um, Entrecom flower, which is basically that research that was done to, to understand what skills an entrepreneur has, one of the crucial skills one needs is to be decisive, okay? And the best way to be decisive is to minimize the barriers to entry to do what you need to do. Glide, I feel like I should get commission from Glide to be fair, but Glide, Card, and a lot of these no-code tools, they give you the ability to create something within hours, if not minutes, that enables you to then prove that you have a good idea. And just to clarify what a good or a bad idea is, right? So 
I remember back in the day watching um, a demo day for an accelerator called Y Combinator and Airbnb were presenting. And I was thinking, hold on a minute, the idea for someone to sleep on someone else's mattress in their front room, that's ridiculous. Who's going to want to do that? Right. But ultimately, a good idea is just an idea that someone else is willing to spend the hard earned cash to kind of get and to kind of use as a product or service. That is what a good idea is. A bad idea. And, you know, on the opposite, it's just an idea that no one is happy to spend money on. So as soon as you can validate that quickly, that really helps you prove that you have a good idea or a bad idea. And to go back to the question, I really believe that if you can act decisively and quickly and effectively by using some of these tools to create a very simple, easy prototype of what your idea is in your head. So you're basically getting out of your head and getting into people's hands then that helps you be a lot more decisive to then figure out what your next step is. All right. Um, and I'm sure you're going to have loads of ideas. As you've seen from my glide dashboard and my car dashboard, I'm someone who has ideas all the time, unfortunately. So I just like to very quickly, very easily prototype them, show them to people, see what they think. If it's a good idea, great. Let me see if I can take it forward. If it's a bad idea, allow it. Let me move on to something else. So hopefully that helps answer that question. Um, someone asks, else has asked, you say launch to enthusiasts. How do we find these wonderful, enthusiastic people? Um, yeah, that's that's a good question and challenging one. So it's always best to start with friends and family and your networks, right? You're going to find enthusiastic people within your networks. But ultimately, and this is a part of the process that I haven't even touched upon. I'm sure, um, Ava, I'm sure, Melissa, I'm sure Becky have taught you this and talked about this a lot more. But it's about understanding who your customer is and the problem they are facing. When I was working for another university, London Southwark University, we did a very deep dive in to understanding the problem you're striving to solve, right? And for who? Who actually has that problem? You want to create what's known as a customer persona, which is basically in your head, who is the customer? Now, I used to have as a client Unilever, and Unilever are basically a big company that have a number of different brands. And they told me a story once about how they came up with the brand links. Basically, they had this fragrant for a deodorant and they didn't know who it was gonna be compelling for. So what they did, they thought about all the different deodorants in the market and they came up with their customer persona. And their customer that they started to try to provide value to was a guy who they called Tom. Now, without trying to be very stereotypical about this, and I apologize if this may be offensive, Tom was someone who had just started university, just moved away from home to go to university. He was living away from home for the first time. So he was probably a bit like myself when I went to university. He probably didn't wash as much as he was as he should have. He probably didn't wash his clothes very often. But at the same time, he wanted to have the whole university experience. He wanted to meet the opposite sex and have a great lifestyle. All right. So what they recognized was that Tom wasn't ultimately just looking to smell good and feel good, but he wanted to actually meet people based on how he felt, based on how he smelt, and based on how um, he used the products that helped him feel this way. And so what they did, they created links as a brand to appeal to people like Tom, to help people like Tom feel good when they wore this deodorant. And I'm sure we've all seen the links have which you spread and all the opposite sex come and you're attracted to them or attracted to them, you know, but it's, 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 um, it's glamorized massively, but it's about trying to understand who you're targeting. And there's a very, there's a number of different processes to help you understand that. And as I said, I'm sure Michelle, Becky and David can kind of give you a lot more detail around that um, to give you a bit of a framework as to how you find your enthusiasts. But initially, it's always great just to speak to family, friends, those in your existing network to find out what they think about your product and whether they resonate with the pro the problem you're trying to solve and also the way you're trying the way in which you're trying to solve it as well. So hopefully that helps to answer that question a bit. It's about really understanding your your customer initially. Um, okay, I'm making a podcast quality. Um, how would you suggest is the best way to prototype that? How would you go about showcasing an online product? Okay, perfect. So I've got a friend who's making a podcast as well. Podcasts are super, super important. simple, sorry, to prototype because ultimately there's apps out there like anchor.fm. There's even Zoom. You, what you can do, if you have a subject matter for your podcast, if you have someone who is an expert in that subject, just say, look, mate, can we have a call? Let me call you on Zoom. And then record that call, right? 
right? Once you've recorded that call, you've got the audio file, you've got the video file, you can chuck it on YouTube, you can chuck it on Spotify very easily. You have a prototype for the podcast. If it resonates with people, yeah, do it again. Get another friend, call them up, say, look, do you want to have a Zoom call? So podcasts are super, super easy to prototype. And again, it gives you so much value, so much feedback as to how people resonate, people resonate with the subject, with the expert that you're talking to, and also with how you're putting together the podcast. I think the podcast that people get carried away with the whole editing process and the production process. But if you strip that right back, the most compelling podcasts these days are just conversations with people. If you can prototype that by having a very simple, easy conversation over Zoom or Google Hangouts or even Anchor, which is a specialist podcast platform, then that gives you something where you can actually gain momentum, move forward, iterate further and launch. So hopefully that helped answer that question. Um, how long would you persevere on idea before pivoting on something else? Right. This is this is really putting it to me specifically because I've been running audio wings for almost 10 years, persevering and pivoting. Right. So it's about the feedback that you get. You can't really answer this question and say, oh, I'll give it a month, I'll give it a year, or I'll give it 10 years. It's about the feedback that you get. So if you constantly get negative feedback, and I've been very conscious to say that positive feedback helps momentum, but if you get negative feedback and you've got negative feedback from people that fall into the, the customer persona that you've created, then Negative feedback is good feedback. Positive feedback is good feedback. All feedback is good feedback. But negative feedback helps you clarify that your product or service could be compelling. If you get negative feedback and you constantly get negative feedback, then that is feedback in itself to suggest that the idea may not be one which is valuable and to look at different ways in which you can start to provide value outside of your idea. So there's no time frame as to how long it takes to get feedback. That really is down to you and how quickly you can work to go out to your audience, go out to your, your potential customer and get feedback from them. But ultimately, it's all based on the feedback you get. So again, hopefully that has helped to answer that question slightly. How do you go about approaching a range of investors, not necessarily organizations, but people who you do not know, um, but would potentially invest? Oh, this is a question and a half and a bit of a, a bugbear for me because look, what you are in the business of doing is creating something which you can then gain value from that will then give you value. And I say give you value, monetary value, put money in your pocket, whatever, right? You do not necessarily need investors to do that. I think we're living in a world whereby everyone thinks, oh, I have an idea. Let me go find someone to invest into it. If you are not invested in your idea, i.e. in terms of the time you're putting in, and you're not invested in the idea in terms of the work you've done to validate it, guess what? No one else is going to invest anything into it either, right? So I wouldn't even think about investment until you have done the investment or you've invested yourself in the idea to validate that this idea is a good idea, to validate that people actually want to use the platform product or service that you're creating to then start to take it further. And investment is just one of many ways in which you can take it further. But here's also another point, right? And this is something which I know from a lot of experience of actually my business has recently taken on investment. Investors very, very rarely want to invest in something which is not proven. All right. Investors do not want to invest in something which is not proven. What investors want to do is see that there is an idea here that has some sort of traction or momentum whereby people are either paying to use it or frothing at the mouth to use it enthusiastically so that they can use their hard earned cash to basically amplify the interest that your idea is already getting. OK, so if you can develop an idea that has interest, that is validated by people that are signing up or paying to use the idea, that product, that service, that experience, then you can think about investors who then then start to amplify the audience that you reach. Does that make sense? Hopefully. So, yeah, long story short, you're not at the stage to think about investment right now. Just think about how you get people on board to your idea to validate that it's a good idea or a bad idea. That's the first thing you do. Um, Next question. With so many similar competitors in the market, how can you make sure to stand out? Oh, that's a, that's a tough question to answer. And it's one which is only really relevant to your idea specifically, because going back to the business model canvas, there are a number of ways in which you can stand out as an idea, whether that's down to who you're focused on. So, for example, I got a friend who created a data nap and his data nap was for only Kanye West fans. Right. And as a data nap, 
it's great because there's so many dating apps out there that have massive markets. But ultimately, for Kanye West fans, of which I'm not the, massive, the biggest fan of his, but ultimately, he was able to bring together fans of Kanye West who wanted to date and meet people. And so he was able to service a niche market with an opportunity with a really compelling and novel idea. And he launched it, did well for a year, and then it flopped. But nevertheless, it was a great story. Um, but yeah, ultimately, it's going back to that business model canvas and looking at how you can provide a really compelling service to a niche audience, because ultimately you understand who that audience is. You understand the problem they have. You understand the things that they want from the idea because you've talked to them, you've, you've invested them into your development process and you can launch to them because you understand them and they understand what you're developing. Um, but yeah, just broadly speaking, I mean, there's a number of ways you can, which you can differentiate from the perspective of the brand that you create around it, the ethos of the brand, right down to the features and benefits of the product or service you're looking to launch, as well as the revenue model that you hope to have to underpin your idea, product or service. Um, Fantastic. Cool. Well, that's, that's probably a good point. I think you've answered all of our questions. Is this, is this, is this okay with you if we, chew, if we use this moment to thank you hugely and to wrap up? Absolutely. Thanks again for inviting me. Hopefully that's been um, interesting for you and um, really looking forward to seeing the outcome of this weekend for you. I really hope that you're having a great weekend. So thanks.